who has dedicated his career to the public understanding of science and the joys of learning. As director for the National Center for Earth and Space Science Education, he is responsible for overseeing the creation and delivery of national science, technology, engineering, and math, or STEM, education initiatives. These initiatives focus on Earth and space, including programs for schools, families, and the public, professional development for grade K through 12 educators, and exhibitions for museums and science centers. Dr. Goldstein has received numerous awards for science education. He was awarded the Astronomical Society of the Pacific's 2005 Klumpko Roberts Award for outstanding contributions to the public understanding and appreciation of astronomy. He was also named the 1995 Barry M. Goldwater Educator of the Year by the National Capital Section of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. In 2001, as director of the Voyage National Program, he led the interorganizational team that permanently installed the Voyage Model Solar System on the National Mall in front of the Smithsonian. Prior to his current position, Dr. Goldstein served as Executive Vice President for Space Science Education and Research at Challenger Center for Space Science Education. Dr. Goldstein received his MS and PhD in Astrophysics from the University of Pennsylvania and was the recipient of the 1990 Outstanding PhD Thesis Award. He received his BA in Physics from the City University of New York. He is proud to have attended the Bronx High School of Science. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. <laughs> Jeff Goldstein. So let me, um, let me tell you a little bit about um, myself. I'm an astrophysicist that about 25 years ago got very involved in science education on a national level. And um, I spent a lot of time looking at how the scientific community can actually help the education community so that both of these great communities can work together in science education. And this was long before this acronym STEM came on the scene. And if I, if I were to kind of characterize the difference between science and STEM, I, I use them interchangeably. Uh, and the, the reason I say that is that scientists and engineers have always been practicing STEM. You can't do science and engineering without integrating across science, technology, engineering, and math disciplines. It's not doable. The, the reason that the STEM acronym came on the scene is really because it was to focus attention on the fact that we stovepipe those disciplines when we teach them in our education system, where science, technology, engineering, and math don't necessarily get integrated. And you're lucky if technology is anything more than having students learning computers and, and applications. Um, so STEM really is a push towards that kind of integration. And I, my view is that that integration has to go far beyond just science, technology, engineering, and math. There should be integration across the curriculum. Um, I'm, so I'm going to talk about science, I'm going to talk about STEM, I'm also going to talk about the fact that what we do on, on the frontiers of human exploration wells from what it means to be human. And that actually has a lot to say about education as a whole. So you story from an emotional vantage point. By the way, look, I, I don't wear a pocket protector. <laughs> I don't have a white lab coat, I'm a scientist. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm explaining to you what science is. Okay, it is, an, it is a deeply emotional endeavor. And so when you're up on the summit, you're there with the most powerful telescopes on Earth. And when you sit down for, for um, dinner, which is the first meal of the day before you go up for the night, you're there with the Japanese, you, the Europeans, uh, astronomers from all over planet Earth come to you. And so what you, what you see on the summit of Mauna Kea is a sense of legacy 
These are the powerful tools of exploration that now allow us to go where we've never gone before as a human race, to peer to the edge of the observable universe. And standing on the shoulders of past generations, this is the here and now. And so you get a sense that you are part of this legacy of human exploration that goes back countless generations. You're part of this remarkable story of exploration. And the third part of this story, this, this kind of, the third chapter in my story of you know, emotional uh, experience on Mauna Kea is I remember there was this time when I was working on my laser and it's really persnickety, it's got to have the right DC high voltage on it, it's got to be kept very, very cold. And my friend Fred was using a joystick to control this massive telescope and we were looking on Venus, measuring upper altitude circulation winds on Venus for the very first time in human history. And I remember hanging out with my laser doing my thing and I, I, I remember thinking, this is like so cool, you're getting to see something no human being has ever seen before and you started out in Little Red Train Nursery School. <laughs> and, and when students talk to me, they say, well, where did you go to school? And the right answer is, well, I started in Little Red Train Nursery School. <laughs> and, I, and the point that I try to make is that the power of one is astounding. It lives in each and every one of us. The power of one to move the world in creative new ways. It doesn't have to be astrophysics. It could be teaching. It could be medicine. It could be a painter that puts brush to canvas in a new way, or, or, or a, a poet who puts prose to paper in a new way. We have the ability to take the rest of the human race to places we've never been. The power of one is something that all of our children need to understand. So this is what it feels like to do science. And Question, how far can you see? 10 miles, 20 miles? But a nice clear day, no clouds, no cirrus. 10, 20 miles? Forever. Can you see the moon? Sometimes. That's 240,000 miles away. We can see the sun. That's can you 90, see the sun? 93 million. That's 93 million miles away. Can you see that star Betelgeuse I showed you? Yeah. That's 500 light years away. The light took 500 years to get here. The light is just getting here, though it was packaged when Christopher Columbus set foot in the New World. And every light year is 6 trillion miles. So 6 trillion times 500 is 300 trillion miles. You can see 300 trillion miles away. You can even see the core with the naked eye of the biggest next large galaxy to us, the Andromeda Galaxy, which is 2 million light years away. So that's 2 million times 6 trillion miles. Can you see far? Yes. Can you feel the majesty of that simple, elegant question? Okay, a question is phenomenal. Here's another one. Um, I was doing a presentation to uh, colleagues at the National Zoo in Washington talking about inquiry-based exploration. And one of the folks in the audience, this was many years ago, Roger Rusco, who was a, a, a curator in the reptile house at the National Zoo, said, yeah, Jeff, I know what you mean about the power of a question, because when I was a little kid, the question that really kept me going is, I wonder what's under that rock. <laughs> I wonder what's under that rock. And he'd run over to his backyard and pull up the rock and see a brave new world of creatures he never would have set, seen if he didn't ask that question. Right? Inquiry based is, is not just, you know, asking the question, it's acting on the question and interacting with it and exploring. And so he was so overcome with joy in, in the answer to that question that he went out and he started lifting up every rock in his backyard. And when he finished that, he went to rocks all over the neighborhood. And I said to him, you know, that's really kind of cool, Roger, because when I was a little kid, one of the questions that I used to love to ask is, I wonder what's in that rock. And I remember taking my dad's hammer and just whacking rocks over them all over the yard. Um, and I've talked to geologists, professional geologists, who said, well, that's how I got involved in geology. So the, the magic of a question is, is really quite remarkable. And so here's something really, really important that we, we ought to kind of keep, keep in our pocket at all times. Next time a child comes at you with question after question, Consider it a gift, because they chose you, right? We, we try to, oh, another question. Okay, they're only acting on what, what it means to be human, and they chose you. So get with the program. <laughs> so how does one answer a question? How do you answer? You have a question about the universe. How do you answer? 
with another question, how's that going to get you an answer? After, after you answer it, that might lead to another question, but how do you engage and a a answer that question? Oh, somebody said Google. <laughs> that's, that's cheating because what you're going to get is somebody else's answer to that question. How do you answer the question? You have to explore. You know what you got to do? You have to interact with the universe. You know what you got to do? You got to poke the universe somehow. Hey, universe, I got a question for you. I want an answer. Roger physically went over to the rock and he, he, he poked the universe. He interacted with, he lifted the rock. To answer all those questions, uh, you know, answer all of that, the, the question of how far can you see, people had to stop light coming streaming into Earth with big telescopes and analyze it. We had to get in the way of the universe and say, hey, I want to know the answer to this question. And that's how we found out how far the moon is and the sun and the stars and the galaxies. You have to interact with the universe. And what's interesting is when you do that, when you do that, you reveal another characteristic, another core characteristic of what it means to be human. Think of a baby. Does a baby explore near versus far and up versus down in texture and color? Why? Well, the why is because they're curious, okay? But what do they get out of the act of poking the universe? I'm sorry? Satisfaction. They do. They get satisfaction, but they also reveal how the universe works. Right? They understand what the texture is. They understand what near, this is near and this is far. They understand how the universe works. And they understand how they can interact with the universe. Two fundamentally different things. To get a, a picture of how the universe operates and how we fit in that universe. And so a baby is born. We humans are born evidence-based learners. Somehow as we go and become more sophisticated and grow to adulthood, we wrap the cloak of belief around us and say evidence is no longer that important. But, but to, a, to a, a, a child, a baby, evidence-based learning is absolutely vital and essential. The idea is they poke the universe, and the universe provides evidence and it's often repeatable evidence. And so we are born curious, and we are born evidence-based learners. That's how we interact with the universe. And we process the evidence, the data coming in, so we can build world models of how the universe operates. So that's sort of like fundamental to what it means to be human. Now let's jump to science, and let me talk more broadly about STEM. Okay, because as I said before, science has always been STEM. Well, what do professional scientists and engineers do? They're in the business of organized curiosity. Organized curiosity. They ask, ask hopefully, smart questions that will lead to a, a, down a pathway to an answer. They can bring powerful tools to bear that you know, our, our young children can't bring to bear. But fundamentally, it's organized curiosity. And a scientist or an engineer is also in the business of evidence-based learning for the entire human race. So let's say a scientist pokes the universe somehow, and the universe reveals some new phenomenon for the first time. And the, the scientist is giddy with joy. It's like, I've seen, I've pulled back the veil of nature, and I've seen some new aspect of how she operates. And so the scientist publishes this in a refereed scholarly publication, and it goes out to the rest of the community, and the rest of the community can, can actually say, we don't believe you. <laughs> and the scientist, he, he or she can say, that's okay. You don't have to believe me because I told you exactly how I poked the universe in the paper. So you go poke it the same way and see what evidence it presents to you. So what I'm really saying here is that scientists and engineers, the professionals that practice STEM, are simply doing things that organically grow from what it means to be human, curiosity and evidence-based learning. And that should say something about the direction that science education, more generally STEM education, more generally all education ought to be taking. So let me go on. So far, so good? 
Okay. So going back to your address, right? Our place in the greater cosmos. What drove us to reveal all this? Innate human curiosity. We need to know. We need to know what's on the other side of that mountain. And how did we re reveal all this? We dared to poke the universe and interact with it. And so we engaged in evidence-based learning. Those are the two drivers uh, of why I can tell you that address. And if you then ask, well, what do you get when you put those two drivers together on a professional level? You get science. And another name for science is inquiry-based exploration, as long as evidence is rolled into that. And inquiry-based exploration is a buzzword in education. So let me give you some views on, on how all this fits together. I believe that we must, we must stop teaching science in STEM, but, but science in general, as a book of knowledge. It never was. When we teach science as a book of knowledge, we do a terrible disservice to our students. Um, we have to stop simply teaching at science. Well, scientists do this and do that, and here's, you know, here's what science is like. You know, that's, it's like, I, I, was, I was once asked by a teacher, a, frustra a frustrated teacher, it, wasn't, it was a statement, it wasn't a question. After a workshop I did many years ago, I said, I'm really frustrated. They're asking me to shove three gallons of water into a one gallon bucket. And now, because that was like 20 years ago, it's probably, you know, 300 gallons into a one gallon bucket. And I looked at him and I said, well, you can't do that. It, it goes against the laws of nature. You can't do that. We have to stop teaching science as a book of knowledge. It never was. A, science as a book of knowledge is completely unrecognizable to scientists and engineers, which tells you something about a direction that, a wrong direction for science education that Per, still today pervades the country. I believe that science education ought to model science. I believe that if science as practiced by scientists and engineers is organically grown from curiosity and evidence-based learning, our children are fully capable of doing science right now. So let's immerse them in our classrooms in Germany. Let's not just talk about it, let's put them inside the act of journey. And, and that active journey comes with a certain number of characteristics. Before I get there, what is this all driven from? What is this derived from? Well, science models learning as a biological imperative. We are born to explore. We are born as evidence-based learners. Science models learning as a biological imperative. And I say science education ought to, ought to model science. And if I keep going one more, learning as a biological imperative ought to inform all disciplines of human endeavor. All disciplines. And so what I'm saying here is the scientific method, you've heard of the scientific method, that's a misnomer, okay? First of all, we, do a, a, we, we often do a disservice to the scientific method when we teach it as a recipe to be memorized. The scientific method is an art form. And if you have the same problem given to two researchers, this person will do it completely differently than that person. The scientific method is an art form. Many scientists refuse to put forward a hypothesis because they don't want to bias the results. You know what the scientific method is from, from many laboratories? Let's poke it and see what happens. <laughs> Let's point the Hubble Space Telescope to a dark patch of sky and keep the, the, the camera open for a really long period of time and see if we see something Oh wow, 10,000 10, galaxies at the edge of the known universe. We just took a picture of the universe when it was only 500 million years old. We can't teach the scientific method as a rigid, rigid recipe. We can't turn the scientific method into the book of content. And the process, the scientific method is supposed to represent a process for exploration, and that process is not locked up by science. That process can be used in any discipline. Think about a chef who, who's trying a different recipe. They're using the scientific method. Well, let's add a little salt and taste it. Let's see how it tastes. What if we bring these two ingredients together? What will be the texture? 
What about an artist who puts brush to canvas? Well, let's, com let's, let's try this kind of stroke. Maybe that will give us the effect that we want. That is evidence-based learning. That is inquiry-based exploration. And it goes across all disciplines of human endeavor because that's how the professionals actually do it. That's, and I told you, you might hear some things that you don't agree with, but I feel very passionately about this, as you can see. And I have three cups of coffee. Okay, so, <laughs> So let me give you some meandering thoughts. Um, I, I like to, you know, Twitter is incredible, okay? Twitter is incredible. We have to, we have to keep our students uh, off of social media because it's dangerous. But it's okay to let them cross the street with two-ton vehicles flying by. <laughs> you know, when the, when the bolt flying pen came on the scene, you had a lot of people saying, this is terrible, this is terrible. People are going to not remember how to, how to use a quill pen. Okay, social media are here, okay, and we need to put them to use. And if I have the ability to have a conversation with somebody on the other side of the planet from my phone over here and have a conversation about something that impacts our entire world, we can't deny that to our students. We have to treat, tr teach them safety like we teach them to walk to school with two-ton vehicles flying down the street. So, I'm, so Twitter is, is remarkable in the reach across the globe. And 7 p.m. on Tuesday nights, Ed Chat takes place, and 400 people from all over planet Earth talk about whatever the topic is. 400 educators talk about the topic uh, that week. So let me just give you uh, some, some t and by the way, as you can see, I can talk for five hours. I don't want to run into the concurrent session. <coughs> Mary, I, I heard you yesterday, so I know that you're very, very, you, you, it was so much fun listening to you yesterday at the President's, uh, the president's get together. Can, can you just like throw something at me when I'm five minutes from the end? Okay, and how much time do I have? Okay, good. Okay, I, I think I'm pretty much on time. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you some some of these tweets that I've put out that kind of go viral every once in a while. It's really remarkable to try to encapsulate a really powerful thought in 140 characters. And, and, and Twitter is really, really amazing to, to get thought out into the public arena. So the first one, it's the student's classroom and the teacher, it's not the teacher's classroom. It's not supposed to be the teacher, it's the student's classroom and the teacher lights the way. That's a really important piece of information. A classroom is not a place, as I said before, it's a frame of mind. And a kind of a corollary to that, a classroom is anywhere a teacherly, patiently, and artfully guides a student on their journey, their journey. A question we should be asking but don't is what is the role of education? How, how many people feel that we do not ask that question enough? What is the role of education? How many people think we, we do ask that question enough? What is the role of education? How many people don't know how to play this game? <laughs> how many people are just too cool to answer? Okay. Um, <clears throat> you know, uh, let me give you an example of what I mean here. Okay. Um, Actually, no, that's not what I wanted to I, I think, I, well, it's true. I, a core goal should be joyful learning leading to joyful employment. Uh, joyful employment? Yeah, yeah. Shouldn't the goal be to, to be immersed in employment and when the paycheck comes says, I even get paid to do this. Shouldn't we be teaching our kids joyful education leading to joyful employment? Shouldn't that be really top of mind in everything we do? to let them know what it means to go down that pathway that they're choosing, that I want to be a pro football player. Well, have you thought about how many people want to be pro football players and how many actually get in? Real data. Okay, it's, you know, what I'm really saying is that you gotta make smart decisions along the way. If, you, if, if schools and education are meant to nurture what it means to be human and embrace the learner's curiosity and embrace evidence-based learning, Okay, if education is meant to nurture that, then learning should be joyful. When learning washes over you, it should feel good. And going through the formal education system should be an extension of what it means to be human. And you just have to make the right decisions along the way, the way so that you maximize the ability to get a good job and earn money, right? So, 
Another core goal. A core goal should be students capable of critical thinking on demand. I don't think we're doing a good job as a nation in turning out students that are capable of critical thinking on demand. Success in the classroom. When the student can't wait to get to class and the teacher can't wait to get to class. Hmm. And, um, and so going back, I, I have this slide out of order a little bit, what, asking what is the role of education? Let me go back to that a second and say, well, why do I have to, student, why do I have to learn all this stuff system because we want you to get a good job as a search engine? <laughs> when it comes to education, we've, we've got to stop telling our kids that knowledge is power. It's not. Knowledge is not power. Knowledge is everywhere. Give me a question, I'll go on Google, I'll have the answer in 10 seconds. Power is understanding what to do with knowledge. The ability to use knowledge, that's power. It's like, you know, another way to look at it is, you know, when something, you know, if everybody prints up, you know, if the government prints up zillions and zillions and zillions of dollars and money is everywhere, what's the, what's the value of money? It's not much, right? Because it's everywhere. In the 21st century, in the age of Google, where the entire book of knowledge of the human race is online and every one of our students know it, the idea of teaching the book of knowledge in terms of memorize all of this stuff is absolutely silly. And any education system that embraces memorize all this stuff is not living in the 21st century. And I can't even say the beginning of the 21st century anymore because it's 2013. So, <clears throat> the other asset, and again, I'm, I'm very passionate about these beliefs, and I've put them to the test with hundreds of thousands of uh, programming for hundreds of thousands of students. Um, education must not be about dictating to our children what they ought to be curious about. You know, think about this. Is it really right? Is it, is it, is it, is it really treating humanity correctly to force them to sit in the classroom for seven hours a day and we dictate what they ought to be curious about. That's not the way to do it. Now, an artful teacher, and you know what I'm talking about, can engage their class to be curious about things that he or she wants to cover. But the idea is ownership in learning. A good example of this is when, when I had to build the laser system for the infrared heterodox spectrometer, Nobody handed me. Um, uh, nobody handed me the directions for how to build this thing. It had never been built before. And if somebody had handed it to me, I would have refused it because why would I want to do that to myself? Why would I want to take all of the joy out of this challenge? And so, uh, an equivalent way of saying this is that as soon as a science teacher hands the procedures for an experiment to the class, you've just assured that there's no science being done that day. Because who owns it if you hand the procedures to the class? Teacher does. That's not the way science works. They have to own it. They've got to own it. And the elementary school generalists will say, Jeff, that's really crazy. Are you going to expect me to go and, and navigate over this landscape where everybody's in, 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 you know, freewheeling whatever they want to do? No. My, my compromise is a teacher, and, and teaching is an art, okay? A teacher can navigate the class to a place where they come up with the experiment you happen to have written up. <laughs> now, let me say it again. An artful teacher, teacher as artist, can navigate a class through facilitated questioning to a place where they come up with the experiment you happen to have written up. And that's night and day, because if they come up with the experiment, who owns it? They do. Look how little change it takes to go from one extreme to the other. Um, education, the more general statement, I think, is education that denies our children their curiosity and their need to poke the universe. And be it known that they are born curious and they need to poke the universe is not education worthy of our children. And I think the biggest thing here is education must not serve testing. Testing must serve 
one result of testing serving, uh, one result of education serving testing, one result of education serving testing. Students don't want to go to class, and teachers don't want to go to class. That's not what, that's, that's, that's not what teachers sign up to do. Um, so here's the, the ultimate irony in all of this, okay? And I, I think that what I'm trying to do is impart some hopefully pearls of wisdom, particularly to the pre-service teachers to roll into your thinking, okay, in terms of how you want to proceed into the profession. These are not meant to simply um, say the education system is, is, is doing it all wrong and we should not be able. We can make changes to our education system to correct these issues. Right now, in the United States, with this fundamental goal of testing, 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 okay, what, has, what we are doing is actually de-educating. We're, we're beating the curiosity out of our students. Um, the ownership and learning is not being given to our students. They're on the receiving end. Um, loss of the love of learning, which is something that we're, we're, we're born with. Learning should be lifelong. Our students have limited capacity to critically think and problem solve. Um, and they're not very capable of interdisciplinary exploration. And I went to a, a major Ivy League university and I gave a talk. <coughs> I gave a presentation, and, and I, you, know, you can't do it with a thousand people, but in a class of 50, I was asking questions. And they looked at me like, what are you doing? You're asking a question. <laughs> because all their education has been a professor putting up information on a, on a board, and it's a one-way, just, just let it go through a pipe. Right? So where's the ownership and learning? Where's the curiosity? Where, where is all that? Where's all the stuff that wells from within us in terms of what it means to be human. So I think in, in kind of closing here, I, I'd like to leave you with something I think that's really, really important here, going back to what is innately human. You know, if we're born curious, if we're born evidence-based learners, the journey, therefore, must be written in our genes. The journey is written in our genes. The book of knowledge is not. So what should that tell us about the role of education? Well, how should we be informed as educators? Should we be concentrating on the book of knowledge? Or should we be concentrating on immersing content in journey, in process? And in fact, the next generation science standards do exactly that. Across STEM disciplines, um, they put a high priority on process and content embedded in process. Um, so, education needs to be about the journey, and it needs to be about their journey. Um, when, you, when you ask what are the core skills associated with this kind of approach, ownership and learning, critical thinking, problem solving, navigation of an interdisciplinary landscape, teamwork, that's what scientists and engineers bring to their jobs every day. And what's really kind of cool about this, is I don't care what the jobs are in the future, I can't predict what the jobs are gonna be, but I can tell you that 21st century employers, when looking for prospective employees, are gonna look for employees that do that. Independent, you know, so you wanna immunize, you immunize your children against an uncertain job market in the future, you know, what the jobs will look like, that's how you do it. So, and, and let me just end with, I think, three slides. My view is let children, in the case of science and STEM, let our children do science and STEM. That's got to be a, a core foundation in science and STEM education. And I've put that into practice. Um, we created, uh, just a few years ago, the Student Spaceflight Experiments Program, which gives a community that participates their own very real space program. And 300 students are fully immersed in every, every aspect of real microgravity research and proposal writing, and they have their own conference at the Smithsonian. And of those 300 students in that community that are vying for a microgravity experiment, one is chosen to go to the International Space Station and have an astronaut assigned as a, uh, as a technician to operate it. And these students are being asked to be scientists and engineers in every sense of the word, writing real proposals, designing real experiments, um, going through real 
proposal review and competition, and it starts at fifth grade. In fact, we have two fifth grade experiments on the International Space Station right now. So if you want to learn a little bit more about one of the programs where we put to practice what I just preached, come to the seminar theater at 2 o'clock and help me to go through this. And we just put out our announcement for mission 6 to the International Space Station, which starts February of 2014. So with that, I'm going to end with one quote that is the prettiest way, the most elegant way I've ever seen human exploration put to paper. We shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all of, our, all of our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. T.S. Eliot's Four Quartets. We shall not cease from exploration because we're impelled to explore. That's what it means to be human. And the act of exploring is to come back, maybe with a cup of coffee in hand, and say, I thought I knew this place when I left, but because of what I've just seen, just experienced, I know the place for the first time, and it feels good. And so as you leave this, um, this get-together, remember that little story I told you about your address. And ask yourself the question, in that just tiny little story I told, do you feel like you know the place for the first time, and did it feel good? I'm done.